Monday morning to uh, this uh, panel of the Decriminalizing Neighborhoods Conference. And uh, this is the panel on uh, understanding and defeating gang injunctions in California. Uh, I'm James Spady. I'm an associate professor of American history at Soka University of America. Um, I study race and settler colonialism, empire, resistance to colonization. Uh, and I, I published a book last year, Education and the Racial Dynamics of Settler Colonialism in Early America uh, from Routledge which was last year. Um, and I'm really happy to be here with you. I've been a member of Chicano Sanitos for about, uh, geez, since 2007, what is that, 14 years? And I see some of my fellow current and former members online with us today. Um, somebody is telling me they're back. I'm not sure who that is. One moment, let me check the list. Doesn't seem to be anything I need to do. Anything about. Forgive me, I'm doing the host and the chairing thing at the same time right now. I won't have to do them both forever. Um, so yeah, I just wanna, um, introduce the individual speakers, make a couple, I was asked to make a couple preliminary remarks and then I'll introduce the speakers. Um, as I mentioned, I'm a member of Chicano Sanitos and I just wanna tell you a little bit about what Chicano Sanitos is. But first, um, it'd be a good idea to acknowledge that we're on the land of the Ahashman people. You see Irvine is, that is to say, which of course is hosting this. That's the indigenous people of this region of Orange County. Um, and you know, they're still here, the Ahashman, and uh, currently pursuing federal recognition. And I think it's good that we acknowledge that uh, at least some of us and the host is on their land. Um, let me introduce uh, Chicano Sanitos for a moment. Um, there's, it's not the only organization that's represented on here, um, but I'll, I'll briefly say one thing or two about Chicano Sanitos. It's founded in 2006. Uh, at least one of the founding members here is with me, Susan Webino, and uh, with us. And uh, it's a multi-generational, multi-ethnic uh, community organization based mainly in Santana, um, but thinks of itself as being really all about Orange County in general. And we've worked on a whole number of campaigns over the years. Perhaps most importantly for us here today, of course, are the gang injunction campaigns. Chicano Sanitos helped lead uh, the defeat of the Orange Vario Cyprus uh, gang injunction in 2009 and 2011. Um, helped lead that, help you know, support and lead and organize that court battle as well as the grassroots community organizing and has been working for a long time in Orange County against the Townsend Gang Injunction in Santana and um, a variety of others doing support work. You're going to hear more about that from Gabby, so I don't need to say very much more about that, um, but I thought I'd say that much. Um, I want to thank, um, as far as that work goes, Gabby and uh, Carolyn. Gabby Hernandez is on this uh, call with us this morning and Carolyn Torres, who I believe is not. Um, and, and all my co-authors in the article that we're writing. Um, and I can tell you now, I'll just say this, um, as of last week, uh, the article that we're writing on these gang injunction campaigns has been accepted for publication. Um, it should appear this summer from a journal uh, called Radical Americas. It's published through the University College at London. Um, and when that comes out, perhaps somehow it can be shared with you all, anybody who contacts me or anyone else uh, who's one of the co-authors, Susan, Gabby, Alex, uh, could get a link to it. It's going to be online, freely available, no paywall, no registration wall, um, so anybody can read. Um, so let me introduce the individual speakers. I'm afraid I'm going to end up taking up more time than I intended to. So I'll introduce them in the order they're going to uh, talk this morning. We hope to have about half an hour for a conversation, you know, sharing strategies, things like that. So first up is uh, Francisco Romero, also known as Chavo. Chavo is an organizer with Union del Barrio uh, and is currently based in Los Angeles. Um, Frank, second will be Frank uh, Barajas. He's a professor of history at Cal State University Channel Islands. Uh, he's the author of uh, Curious Unions, Mexican-American Workers and Resistance in Oxnard, California, 1898 to 1961 from 2012 published, and Mexican Americans with Moxie, a transgenerational history of El Movimiento Chicano in Ventura County, 1945 to 1975. That's coming out this year, or it's coming out this year. Uh, and then in 2007, he published an article, a very good article, I might recommend everybody to read in the journal Latino Studies titled, An Invading Army, a Civil Gang Injunction in the Southern California Chicano uh, Community. Next up will be Alex Scott. Alex is a PhD student, and I might say one of my former students from Soka University, uh, but now a PhD student at uh, the University of California at Riverside, um, where he's studying sociology. Uh, ABD, I believe now, right, Alex? 
he began his studies on gang injunctions as an undergraduate at Soka University in Orange County. And our last speaker um, will be Gabby Hernandez Castillo. Uh, she's a licensed clinical social worker uh, for the past 13 years working in Orange County with some of the most vulnerable youth and their families. She grew up on the east side of Santa Barbara and at the age 12 was placed on probation getting into a fight at school. Um, she remained on probation until she was 18 years old with support from her family, providers, and community members. She transitioned to community college, followed by a bachelor's degree in criminal justice at Long Beach State University, and then a master's in social work at the University of Southern California. She's been an organizer with Chicano Sanios, uh, uh, Orange County for the past 10 years, focusing on issues of social justice, including gang injunctions. Gabby's been one of the great leaders of this effort in our organization. Gang databases, gentrification, and is a co-founder of the Orange County Legal Clinic. She's led multiple gang injunction campaigns that have ended or limited gang injunctions from Santa Ana to Santa Barbara. Really happy to be with you all, my friends, this morning. And with that, I will simply turn it over to our first speaker, who will be from uh, Chava. Yes, good morning, thank you. Uh, my, my remarks will be brief. Uh, I'll work to take uh, under five minutes. Really, it was, uh, I, I'm just pleased and honored to be on this panel. Um, the, the folks on here were instrumental in many ways in defeating the injunctions uh, across, uh, across uh, the state of California. And um, I really honor the collect collective approach that we all used along the process over the last 20 years, really. Uh, in defeating the injunctions, learning from each other, uh, I just want to um, give a super uh, mad, as I say, mad props to my compañera here, Gabby, um, who I met uh, in the process of kind of co-learning with each other in Santa Barbara. I formerly was in uh, the city of Oxnard, Oxnard, California, ma mainly me Mexicano community, uh, farm worker, agricultural, uh, kind of transitioning right now, but. Uh, it, it is a traditionally connected um, community just because of where it's located in between uh, Santa Barbara and Los Angeles County, right? So uh, in in uh, Professor Frank Barajas' new book, um, uh, Mexican Americans with Moxie, uh, the, he, he references that, like how how the how important the the universities and and the uh, Cal State systems and the local community college played a role. In in reality, it played a role in my um radicalization and um learning of and unlearning the colonial kind of uh education that i received to more of that of a liber liberatory uh education that i continue to seek every day that is the lens of which we approach our, our struggle and our fight including this one around the gang injunctions so really i i do want to um connect gang injunctions as a process of continued occupation Colonial, a colonial strategy around the control of black and brown bodies. Um, really, it's about control of movement. Uh, you know, it has its origins uh, all the way back to black codes, even even before that, right? Um, and so, making that connection, I want to honor uh, as well that I am uh, currently on Dongva territory here in Los Angeles, uh, formerly organizing out of Chumash community, uh, uh, Chumash People's Territory in Ventura County. So um, learning, co-learning with them as well. I wanted to show a quick map around, um, you know, containment, uh, containment of indigenous people. We consider ourselves as Mexicanos, as indigenous people, but with our northern brothers and sisters along this these territories that, that that we live in, uh, there was a process uh, of genocide, colonialism, containment, and uh, you know, uh, placement of uh, forced removal and uh, imprisonment really onto what folks call reservations, what we call concentration camps. And so that same process of control is the, 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 the origin, if you will, of the strategy of gang injunctions. As you can see um, from the map compared before to now, you know, really it's about cornering us and putting us in what we call uh, open air prisons outside of the walls by right? controlling the population particularly again, black and brown bodies um, across uh, in, in ways that they demarcate it. So there's invisible walls around us, but really it's about militarization, containment and um, repression and oppression, right? These are the, the gang injunctions 
zones, they, they meaning the, the state, the police, the courts, they call them tar- uh, safety zones, but really they're called target zones because we are the targets. Some in San Diego, same thing. And I wanted to touch briefly on, on Oxnard, right? Um, uh, later you'll hear about how the um, injunctions play a process in displacement gentrification. And here's a clear example. You see this blue area in the center, dark blue is what they call the downtown Oxnard, right? They, they, for years they've been trying to make it like a tourist hub and they just can't, right? Um, and, but to do, to do that, they really um, embarked on the process of pushing out a lot of the community. And the lighter blue one here on the right, you that is uh, the neighborhood known as La Colonia. And just in the last several years, they've leveled all of the public housing and got rid and displaced and forced removed um, a lot of the community that 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 had um, created the cohesion uh, along the, the 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 last century, really. And uh, well, what I went ahead and did is put a map together um, using some some uh, as you can see here. It's a it was a a uh, mapping tool that that came out a few years ago. But I want to go back briefly into the origins of wheat and seed. Earlier, I told you the Colonia, which is here in the turquoise uh, line. Colonia went through a process of first uh, the the precursor to the injunctions was the uh, wheat and seed program. Basically the same thing, uprooting, moving, forced displacement, and bringing new, new, new folks in. But as you can see, it's uh, strictly uh, in black and in green are the two injunction zones. And it's where we live, right? Poor, working class Mexican communities. So I wanted to highlight the, um, you know, the, the reality that there is a question of race um, and class involved in the struggle. And finally, I'll end by saying that we counter the, this process by in, uh, invading their space, right? Um, by take going to to the spaces where they they don't want us in, which is where they make decisions, right? So we were constantly there. We we did not let uh, we were relentless in the process of exposing and really educating and co-learning and 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 showing the community that this uh, gang injunctions were really a tool of oppression versus versus a tool of of uh, you know community safety, right? And that we were fighting a lot all, all throughout this time around you know, alternatives to um, militarization and criminalization strategies that have been historically uh, part of the root of the problem for our community. So, and we continue. And I'll pause there uh, because um, it, it's a good segue, segue into the next part around, you know, the importance of documenting our history and our fight I'll end there. And I'll pass it back to um, Professor Spady. Great. Uh, thanks, Frank. You want to go next? Yes. Um... Thank you all for the opportunity uh, uh, to be part of this uh, panel and this conference. Like Chavo, I just want to acknowledge you. Uh, um, I live in Oxnard and I'm zooming in from the land of the Chumash territory and the Chumash people. And so Francisco uh, asked me to talk about uh, history and my role in the gang injunction, a fight uh, that took place in, originally in 2004. Uh, I had just moved back to Ventura County uh, from living in Orange County, uh, Cypress, excuse me, I lived in Buena Park, worked at Cypress College, uh, was there in the, in the belly of the beast when Proposition 187 emerged from there, right? And so uh, that was an experience uh, that really served as kind of the backdrop of how I saw things in Ventura County, my, my home county, uh, when I came back in 2001. Uh, uh, how I, I became involved or interested in involved later was in uh, March of 2004, uh, when the local newspaper, the Ventura County Star, started issuing reports on the implementation of this preliminary, what's called a preliminary uh, gang injunction. Uh, and the uh, police chief at the time, Art Lopez, was, uh, was a transplant from uh, from Los Angeles uh, Police Department, right? And this is what was his new toy uh, that he was bringing to us, right? And uh, then the opposition uh, arose, uh, led by largely, you know, the committee on Rasa rights, uh, led by Francisco and others in the background. Uh, and I became interested in the news reports, and there was this uh, strident. Uh, opposition op-ed that was written uh, uh, 
and penned and named uh, by Francisco, and I read it. And then subsequently, I was watching uh, city council meetings. Uh, for some reason, city council meetings uh, intrigued me. Uh, and then I would uh, see this uh, uh, as an agenda item and also in the public comments uh, period. Uh, Francisco mentioned the issue, issue of invading space, right? And one of the ways in which uh, space was invaded uh, by the community uh, and those particularly who were opposed to the gang injunction was give, you know, taking advantage of those two to three minutes uh, of public comments. Uh, and I became more interested in that. And I began to see uh, parallels uh, being a historian with uh, the gang injunction with that of the Sleepy Lagoon trial. And I was just working on, the, uh, on an article uh, because Alice McGrath, who was the executive secretary of the Sleepy Lagoon Defense Committee uh, lived in uh, Ventura. So I became friends and we, uh, we uh, she helped me with research or we went drove to UCLA to look at her papers. And so I was studying the Sleepy Lagoon trial uh, and uh, I saw parallels uh, even more so than what I knew before. Number one, the issue of dress, <laughs> uh, you know, Pachuco dress, uh, cowboy dress uh, in Oxnard, right, past and present. Uh, and number two, uh, the dragnets, right? Uh, in regards to the dragnets that were uh, exercised in, uh, and also uh, taking place in Los Angeles against uh, so-called uh, Pachuco gangsters, right? And similarly, the gang injunction is a, a, a form of a dragnet, right? Uh, it's, a, it's a legal dragnet. And, so, and then the language became uh, apparent, right? All of the, the vulgar language that was used against Zoot suitors and pachucos, you know, hoodlums, uh, criminals, murderers, uh, bloodthirsty uh, Aztec driven DNA, for example, that was given by one of the uh, Los Angeles uh, uh, sheriff department officials. And you've seen that language begin to be replicated in, in Oxnard, uh, uh, as pointed out by Francisco in one of his articles uh, in the Ventura County Star, you know, the issue of of a pack of wolves, right? That you know we have we have packs of wolves roaming through Oxnard, uh, uh, victimizing innocent people. You know, carrying ba having uh, baby carriages, right? So, uh, and then following uh, the uh, out of the cafe on a, uh, and let me see if I could uh, somehow things uh, change uh, when I try to uh, share screen, but I had earlier. Let me see if I could pull it up. I, I, I may not want to get too, too clunky. Uh, the Cafe had a press conference in May of 2004, in which it was Francisco, uh, Debbie DeBreeze, Armando Vasquez, and other folk there. They had a press conference, and it was a sparsely attended conference. Uh, I would say at Tops, maybe Francisco can correct me, Tops, the conference it was maybe five people, right, <laughs> uh, who, were, who were watching, but it was, it was the press. Uh, it was two, I think, a VC reporter, VC star. Uh, myself, uh, just, uh, uh, I think the public defender was there, uh, but you know this was this was the the voice of opposition, right? Then later on, other organizations, the NWCP of Ventura County, and LULAC of, of Ventura County, then, then began to question it, not so much oppose it, but question the need for the uh, gang injunction, right? So uh, then I, I saw what's my role, uh, and my role was. Uh, because I used to visit the Cafe NA and I knew Francisco beforehand, and, and increasingly they had meetings of the Cafe NA, and you saw this grassroots opposition uh, that, that I like to emphasize in, in Mexican Americans and Mo with Moxie, a transgenerational uh, spectrum uh, of people, right? People in their 20s, for example, people in their 30s, like I was at, at the time. <laughs> 20 years ago. And there was also people that were in their 70s and 80s, right, who were uh, uh, listening and uh, ultimately, ultimately uh, voicing opposition. So I, I was a witness, number one. Uh, and stop me when I'm getting close to my time or give me a minute uh, so I could uh, maybe squeeze in something that I would have wanted to, to put in there, is that uh, uh, I, I offered my talent, right? And, and anytime I was a supporter, uh, then I became a volunteer. Uh, then I became a regular participant. Anytime Francisco or Armando Vasquez or Debbie, you know, needed a, someone to do this, right? And I felt I can do that. And one, one of the issues that came up 
I remember uh, uh, Armando Vasquez at a meeting, it gave us an admonition, right? He says, we have to tell our stories, right? Uh, but we have to write them down. And I always, I always, I, when I'm writing, and even though I think I'm horrible at writing and my, I'm not being as uh, poetic, if you will, or lucid, uh, Marmando's, uh, you know, admonition of, you know, allow yourself to fail and fail miserably, <laughs> right? And, and, and that is so liberating when you're a writer, right? Uh, yeah, of course, you're going to do, do your best, right? But you're going to allow yourself, you know, maybe not to be, uh, a Hemingway, right, or a Gloria on Saldua, right? Uh, you got to allow yourself just to be you. And so I wrote op-eds along with uh, along with CORE, you know, Chicas Organizing for Rights, Education, and Employment. We, we became, we had an official name, and to this day, it's still utilized. So, uh, and we operate out of the uh, Cafe and A, and uh, and I, everybody used their own talents, right? And everybody was a different, thank you, James. Uh, a different soldier, if you will, in, in this opposition. And I'm going to try to, with my two minutes, and it's for some reason, uh, my browser in my uh, my uh, desktop doesn't allow me, but I had these two images of me and Francisco being at hearings. And one of the images uh, was uh, me and Francisco talking to the city council, you know, countering, right? And they wanted to have this special hearing. Uh, administrative hearing for those who should have been in the gang injunction or not, right? This is this, this is the way of retooling and, and preserving the gang injunction all the way to the end. And we just we just emphasize the Fourteenth Amendment that everybody had the right to due process in, in, in a court of law, not by a, a special administrative hearing run by the uh, police department, uh, but by by a judge. And, uh, and also one last thing, I think it's important that, uh, you know, city officials, city council people would come to us after meetings, say, yeah, you know, you're right, the idea of uh, jails, uh, jails without, with bar, without bars, one of the council people told me, you know, this, this, is, this is house arrest. <laughs> but they wouldn't criticize the gang injunction, you know, officially. Right, it was always behind the scenes. It was always, you know, one to one. You know, you know, don't 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 tell anybody. But I really have my reservations about the gang injunction, and they would remain silent. So at least that kind of communication let us know that we had at least uh, an, uh, an open mind in the case of some uh, city councilmen. So I'll stop right there. Thank you. Thanks, Frank. Uh so yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I was a little remiss on the timekeeping there. I forgot to establish that, but I'll, I'll flash up fingers for how many minutes you've got left going forward. Thank you, Frank. Uh, Alex, I think you're next. Great, I'm gonna share my screen. Oh, sorry. For some reason, my system preferences aren't letting me share my screen. Give me one second. It's set so that anybody can share unless someone else is already sharing stuff, so but I, everybody else is sharing, I think is off. So, you uh, so I'm with my computer. Just keep one second. Just okay. have to update my preference. It's not a conference presentation without an AV snafu. That's right. That's right. And if it's helpful, uh, Alex, you could send me the link and I could project for you. That's a great idea, Charles. Okay, let's do that. I'll just I'll just send the link right now. You're putting it in the chat, maybe? Yeah. I guess what, well, Alex sends that over I, on the gang ordinance hearing, 
um, that Frank mentioned, it was the last ditch attempt to try to circumvent the due process hearings at the courthouse in Oxnard. I think that we know of it was the only city, police department and city that tried to do that, where instead of, and, and Gabby will speak to all the, the legislation and the legal battles that they waged with the attorneys, uh, the, the courts said every person that is gonna be listed onto the injunction needs to first have a due process hearing. But it was kind of broad enough where the police interpreted that and the district attorney that, oh, that means we could have a hearing, you know, uh, what we call a kangaroo court, right? Like just something out in the city and, and um, you know, less, less uh, rigid in the question of due process and legal rights, the right to discovery, right to rebuttal, that kind of thing. So a little more on that later in the conversation, hopefully. And I have the presentation. I'll bring it up. Thank you, Chavo. While it's loading, um, if you want to kick off with some conversation, uh, uh, Alex. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I'm Alex Scott. I am a PhD candidate at UC Riverside in sociology. I was James's undergrad student eight years ago, and uh, I'm a former member of Chicano Sonidos. Uh, I'm still a collaborating member, but grad school has ruined all of my hobbies, especially organizing. So I'm not an official member anymore. Um, but yeah, this what I'm going to talk about today is really the culmination of ideas and thoughts that I got out of the organizing work I did with Chicano Sonidos and have been engaged in for almost a decade. And the re a lot of the reasons why I went to graduate school, because I had questions that I couldn't answer um, without going and doing real critical deep study of the issues. So a lot of the things that Chavo was talking about, about the history of gang injunctions, colonization, policing, and the capitalist state, I'm going to basically be putting a little meat on the skeleton that he's provided for us. Um, that, that's what I was kind of asked to do for this panel. So as soon as the presentation is, is up, we can get into it. Um, and what, what one of the main goals that I'm trying to do with this presentation is just offer insights on like moving forward. Uh, how do we move forward beyond just a legalistic of, approach uh, to addressing this issue? How, how are the issues of policing maybe larger than just liberal legalistic reforms? And how do we begin thinking and strategizing around that? How's it going, Chavo? Got it, got it ready to go? Yeah, sorry about that. It's, it's saying I need access. I should have shared access with you via email. Oh, okay, via email. Sorry, one second. Yeah. See if uh, see if we can get it running right now. If not, I can give you some more time to sort it out by having Gabby go first, rather than burn more time waiting. Yeah, that works too. If you if you get it if you get it running in the next minute or so, that's cool. Let's see what happens. Okay, I can go. Hi everyone, okay. thanks for having me. Um, I'm Gabby Hernandez. I am a member of Chicano Sonidos, and I've been a part of them for over ten years now. Um, I hope that I can give you a lot of information on uh, the steps that we take to uh, fight and win against uh, gang injunctions. And if you have any questions, hopefully they can be answered through this presentation. If not, we could definitely talk about it afterwards. Um, but we definitely, I, I usually present this to organizations who are either um, preparing to fight an injunction um, and, and want to know where to start or if they're already uh, in the process um, and they're not sure where it's going. So I'll share my screen. Okay, can you see it? Okay. So, uh, Chicanos Unidos has been involved uh, with the gang injunction fight for many, many years. 
one of the first cases here um, in, in Orange County that was fought was the OVC, the Orange Vario Cypress uh, injunction. And that started in 2009. Um, and our work ended uh, in 2012. However, we were still in contact with the attorneys um, because this case went all the way um, to the district appellate court uh, here in California. Um, and was able to, to win. And I'll talk about what those wins were. But these are really long, long commitments, long fights. Um, sometimes you come around for a second round. Um, so Ova said was the first one. I being originally from Santa Barbara, that's my hometown, um, helped lead one of the fights uh, for the gang injunction there and really took the knowledge that I was learning from Chicanos Unidos and many other organizations, including working with travel folks from Oxnard, um, from, you know, from Los Angeles, even up North. The, the knowledge that I have um, about injunctions, it has been shared to me by other folks. Um, and then we went into the Townsend injunction. That's a community here in Santa Ana. Um, we then, uh, got involved with La Jolla Placentia injunctions in 2015, um, the Tokerstown injunction in Fullerton, and then now we're back to the Townsend injunction because um, they're adding people. And I'll break that down. All right, so where do you start fighting a gang injunction? <clears throat> well, first, it's, gonna, it's really, really important um, that your relationship with the community, so is this, does this community trust you? If not, um, how can you build that trust? And most importantly, do the defendants want to fight the gang injunction? Because, or how does the rest of the community feel about a gang injunction? So one, we find that there's some connection be usually between our organization, Chicanos Unidos, because it has been around for a long time and our members live throughout um, Santana and Orange County. Um, so we usually have like somebody linked into the neighborhood or somebody knows somebody and that's usually how we start. Um, and then um, we try to get a hold of the defendants to see how they feel about the injunction. Sometimes they're like, yes, let's fight it. Other times they feel that it's a huge battle. Um, and, that, and because of previous cases, they feel like maybe I can, I can take a deal uh, and this will go away. But when we explain it to them, then they, they see the severity of it. Um, and then we also get input from the rest of the community. And typically they are not even aware of what it is and how it's gonna affect uh, that area. Um, there's been injunctions where we have had to step back. For example, one of the injunctions in Anaheim after the uprising there, um, they were pushing a gang injunction and we reached out to the community to see if they wanted to challenge it um, and at that time, there was a lot of tension um, in the community, so they decided not to fight it. So we respected their decision, um, and that um, was later added. Okay, so one of the first steps that you take is find attorneys ASAP. Um, when we were fighting injunctions back in, God, 20, 2020, 11, 2012, most attorneys were learning how to fight injunctions. Um, and the ones that knew how to fight were so bombarded with tons of things they were doing. And so we had to make sure that they were linked and that they were sharing knowledge. Um, and they would definitely share like their briefings and any steps that they were taking in court. And when a neighborhood hears about an injunction, um, they we help them clarify, like, is this a new injunction or is this uh, an existing injunction where they're trying to add people? So these are two of the documents. Um, and we have to look at the docu uh, at the actual documents, the summons to see um, when was it issued or, and filed and what the response uh, time is. So for this one, um, it was supposed to be 30 days. And that way we know like how much time do we have to organize and show up to the next hearing or to the first hearing um, and then make sure that we read through, you know, 500 pages of legal jargon with, um, with the defendants and their families. And it's really important that you keep track of these dates. Like when is the next court hearing? Um, what department? 
how you're going to get there. Um, typically, what we would do is some of, some of the people on the, on the injunctions and their families, if they didn't have a vehicle, then we would go pick them up and then go to court. Um, but once you know the date, then you work backwards. So how much time do I have? Do we only have 30 days? Do we have 60 days? And what can we do during that time? As you can see, they look very similar. Um, the one to the right was issued in 2009 and the one to the left was issued in 2020 and they use the same verbiage. It's really important to understand the who, what, why, and how. Um, so who's doing it? Who's pushing this? Um, what is it that they're pushing? What areas? Uh, what terms and conditions? Why? And I'll talk about that as well. Like, why are they doing it now? Um, and then how are they doing it? Okay. So that's a typical packet that our defendants receive, that the defendants receive. Uh, this was the Townsend. It was really, really thick. Um, and then this is the safety zone on the right. So although it's not a large safety zone like we see in other cities, Santa Ana is a really dense city. So there's like thousands of people that live within this area. Um, and then make sure that you're researching and that you're looking at, at any and everything. So the DA website, any press releases because the DAs usually will issue a, a press release prior to pushing an injunction and they'll give the reasons of why they're pushing it. Um, any kind of pub, uh, public uh, coverage, especially in the news. Um, and then looking at city budgets, um, any agenda, city agendas, if they're discussing it, uh, changes in, um, in crime stats, um, and then definitely looking at journal articles. I know that James uh, and Professor Barajas talked about documenting um, these fights in, in journals uh, or in academia, because typically a lot, when we were, when we were fighting the injunctions at the beginning, most of the research was uh, from a lens, like a law enforcement lens. And it was very supportive pro gang injunctions. Um, there was hardly any literature on challenging, uh, you know, injunctions and different perspectives. They were heavily, heavily law enforcement. Okay, so the who, so the what the injunctions here um, in Orange County are usually a, a collaboration from the local police department or the sheriffs um, and the district attorney's office. The city council typically don't, they're not really involved, they're told afterwards, um, but you know, city councils usually support the injunctions. And then understanding the terms and conditions what are the rules? What are they not allowing um, the defendants to do? Uh, as Chapel was saying, they criminalize everyday behavior. So you hanging out outside of your house then becomes criminal. Um, if you're drinking a beer, you're not supposed to consume alcohol and you're 30 years old and they can see you through the window and they can violate you because uh, it's in the public eye. Um, if you're going to a festival down the street um, and it's in the zone and you're talking to your friends, that could also be uh, a violation. So understanding what the terms and conditions are. There's only five minutes? Oh, okay. I'm, I'm gonna have to uh, move, move along. If you go over slightly, it won't be the end of the world. Okay. Uh, so some of the steps that we took, I'll go over that and then the wins, so that's really important. So crime rates, um, break down what it is that they're saying that they're using to push the injunction. As you can see the Sampanita injunction, they use uh, like riding a bike with no helmet as justification to push it and why it was needed. Um, and then looking at what they're, what, what is it that they're saying? So for this injunction, there was, they said, that, you know, there was 16 attempted murders, you know, um, five robberies, and we, we asked for the discovery. So we went through all the legal uh, paperwork and it, the, the police reports um, and found that like none of the burglaries was actually gang related or that the murder attempted murders had no relation to the actual neighborhood and the defendants. Um, so we were able to fight them that way. And creating our own um, reports 
our crime reports and sharing this with the media and sharing this with city council and um, decision makers. And then um, so why now? Look at Looking at gentrification, the school to prison pipeline. Um, are they trying to push this to get more money uh, for law enforcement? Uh, are they trying to look good after something, maybe, maybe there's tension between uh, the police and the neighborhoods? Um, this is a, ma uh, a map, um, a gentrification uh, plan that the city of Santa Ana had presented. Um, and they presented this to investors and they had the gang injunction zones in there. And they were using that to draw in um, investors so that they could see like we're, and we're actively trying to push people out. Um, and if looking at the maps, so how do they compare uh, to the zone? So this is the Ovesta injunction and they overlapped with the gentrification plans in that neighborhood. And then documenting police uh, violence in the community. We, we were doing it by holding accountability clinics and having a space where fam uh, family members were able to come and make uh, police complaints. And then as we, um, yeah, as we got like 20 to 30, then we would submit them to the police department. Um, and then holding the criminal justice accountable. So we started the Orange County Legal Clinic. We have a hotline and we started the court watch program here in Orange County. Um, these are just some of the, uh, our efforts in mobilizing the community, uh, strategies shared, and I can share this with uh, different folks. Can I get a couple more minutes? Okay. Um, holding public forums was really, really important to get information out, whether it was five people or 200 people, uh, but I informed the community on how the injunction was going to affect them. Um, and then also us holding our own press releases, sorry, press conferences. So often uh, the DA or the police department would hold them and then we were available for questions and they hated that. This is just some of our actions we took and then packing the city council meetings, not because we needed their approval, right? Most city council members were not going to side with us, but we wanted to make sure that the information was out. Um, and that they were, it was very clear what it is that they were agreeing to. Uh, and then art logos, we, we did several film festivals and collaborated um, with other organizations. All right, so these, these are the most important. <laughs> what have the wins been? And when you see, when you think about the fight against gang injunctions, there is like some people on the ground that are from or community organizations with no funding, most of us are grassroots, volunteer-based, are the families and the defendants. Um, with very limited resources, fighting this huge monster with unlimited resources, which is the district attorney or the police uh, force. Um, and so wins, any wins are really important because you set the tone for the next injunction or um, if they're trying to expand and add more people, they will see that there is gonna be res a response. Um, and so they're gonna think twice about doing it. So the, with OVSE, uh, that was filed in 20, 2009, uh, the community learned how to formally respond to a gang injunction within 15 days. Um, that was the first time where we really learned how injunctions worked. Uh, we were able to expose police and the DA that they were violating due process rights as the DA dismissed defendants. And when after they dismissed them, they, and because they got attorneys that they then turned around and, and um, added them again. The DA admitted that they dismissed some defendants because of their aggressive effort to defend themselves. Um, defendants filed a, a federal class action alleging that the county's dismiss and serve scheme had deprived them of a fair hearing as to whether they were indeed associated in any way with a gang. Uh, we learned how to paper a judge have the judge changed who rubber stamped all previous gang injunctions. Uh, we exposed Orange Police and the DA that they, ha they actually had no criteria to identify an active gang member. So when they were asked during a deposition um, how they actively, how they identified a gang member, um, they didn't have clear criteria. Uh, and, and also the most importantly, they it set the case law with Vasquez versus Rokakis, which has been used and many of the rest of the gang injunction cases throughout California. Um, we also petitioned um, 
the ACLU to take the case um, on, and they challenged the injunction on multiple grounds. Um, and in November of 2013, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals deemed that the, uh, the injunction violated due process um, and they were able to sue, the, the ACLU was able to sue the county uh, for over $3.3 million. This is from the court ruling. And then we, in Santa Barbara, that was a huge, huge victory because that was the first time that um, we were able to stop a gang injunction from being uh, issued. So we fought it in the courts, in the trial, and the judge decided that an, a gang injunction was not necessary because we were able to prove that it wasn't. Um, this was the first time that we submitted community declarations to the court and had people testify, uh, discrediting the police and the DA claims that they felt uh, that they were in danger. We publicly challenged the DA uh, gang expert who, sorry, looks like a fool. So they brought in somebody that um, from Northern California and our attorneys you know, were able to show that he really didn't understand our community. Um, and that, that, that didn't apply to us. Um, we also were able to get documentation of how much it costs for them to propose the injunction. So they, they spent almost a million dollars, the city spent almost a million dollars just to file the injunction. Um, so that wasn't even two. So you know, when that didn't include any of the court hearings, we still never received uh, the final cost. Um, but this was a case that was going on for three to four years and our, our trial was a month long. Um, so we helped change the political climate in Santa Barbara. Um, so it was really speaking truth to power um, and making them uncomfortable where they were gonna hear um, how this was impacting the community. And then, like I said, the judge denied the preliminary injunction the first time ever in the country at this level. Um, and then the Townsend Santa Ana injunction, uh, we were able to get 14 pro bono attorneys. We pushed the DA to have active participation hearings that a lot of these things are now done. So before they didn't have um, hearings to prove that somebody was actively in the game. Um, and now there's, there's criteria. So they have to be active in the last six months and they have to show how they're active. So prior to, there was a case we had where they used Facebook uh, pictures and posts to show that they were active. That was their evidence. Um, but the judges agree that they ha it had to be critical evidence. Um, they, then this case also pushed the DA to, sh to share the discovery because prior to the judges didn't make them. Um, and they said that it was, you know, uh, uh, harmful to share because of the information that was in there, um, but we told them they could redact, redact names, uh, so we were able to get the discovery for the first time, and that's where we really started seeing uh, the inconsistencies. We also had the court hearings moved from the Superior Court over to the Complex Court, um, where these judges are not as overwhelmed with cases, and they have the time and the knowledge to really break it down and that really helped us um, because they, they were used to the DA was used to doing things a certain way and with certain judges um, and they, they weren't able to anymore. So the gang injunction for Townsend did go through but there was only 14 people that it, um, that it was implemented on. Yeah, and then we, we were able to raise money to have a deposition of the main uh, police gang expert, which we later were able to use on different cases. Um, and then briefly for the La Jolla case, um, that one, we also were able to stop it. Um, so the, we, the judge pressured the DA to show public benefit for enjoining defendants in the gang injunction. Um, some community members were also allowed to join the lawsuit fighting the injunction. And the DA pressured, um, they were pressured to show evidence. That's what I, what I talked about, about the active participation in the last six months. The judge also said, if you have people in jail or on gang uh, probation, 
on probation with gang terms, this is just another layer and it's not necessary. And so they dismissed anybody who was incarcerated or had uh, was on gang terms probation. Uh, and they asked the court to provide attorney. Um, so one of the things that a lot of the defendants that we were working with in the PLAS case um, had special education when they were uh, in school. And so we pushed and argued that they needed uh, court appointed attorneys because they weren't able to uh, understand the process and the judge agreed. Um, so the DA was not used to that and they were really upset um, because they didn't wanna use resources to provide public attorneys. And in the two years that we were fighting this, this case, the DA was not able to find one person who was an active par participant. And so uh, they decided to dismiss uh, this case. I think that's that's it. Great, thank you, Gabby. Um, we're we're obviously running a little behind our schedule. Um, thanks everyone for presenting. I'm going to turn it straight over to uh, Alex. And uh, Alex, you got ten minutes, and then hopefully we'll have a few minutes left for questions still. Sweet. All right, everybody can see my screen. Yes. Okay. Excellent. Okay. Sorry about the sorry about the technical difficulties. Uh, thank you for going before me, Gabby. Allowed me to get a little more caffeinated, so hopefully I can go a little bit faster. Um, just so we can have a discussion. Now, uh, my presentation uh, I've titled it "Policing the Neoliberal City: A Structural Analysis of Gang Injunctions in Southern California." But it doesn't just apply to gang injunctions. It's really an analysis of policing in general over the past few decades. Um, the, the overall purpose of this presentation is to provide a progressive or what I call a structural analysis of policing that challenges the dominant liberal perspectives in the social sciences and in academia in general. Uh, within that, I'm going to discuss the relationship between aggressive, aggressive policing practices like gang injunctions and the neoliberal political economic restructuring of Southern California since the 1980s. And hopefully, I want to demonstrate the value of a serious political economic analysis to organizing around issues of policing. Because our organizing is only as good as our ideas. If we don't have good ideas and good analysis, our organizing won't be as strong. So the format of the presentation is roughly, I'm gonna talk about the traditional social science framings of police in the state, uh, offer my structural critique of these formulations and then discuss the political economic foundations of police and then discuss the neoliberal political economic shift in the eighties and how this has had a huge effect on policing and gang injunctions specifically. And I, I promise, I think I can do that in under 10 minutes. So the typical social science perspective on the state law and policing is really important to understanding gang junctions in general. So the democratic nation state in most liberal social science circles, it's portrayed as this autonomous, neutral, objective and rational organization that acts primarily to serve the general public and make sure that not one particular group can dominate society. Within that, the legal system, laws are seen as these neutral arbiters of justice where policy reform can produce transformative uh, social justice outcomes. And thus the police are viewed as agents of the state and the law who serve to main maintain the rule of law and order in society and protect the rights of ordinary people. Now, I have a lot of issues with that framing, but that is the typical law enforcement approach to gang injunctions and any issues around gangs and policing. Now, the, the, primarily my main issue with that is it's completely ahistorical. Uh, the modern democratic state emerged out of the decline of feudalism, uh, the rise of colonialism and the establishment of capitalism as the global economic system. With the passing of feudalism and monarchical political rule like kings and queens, this, this type of democratic state developed as an executive or committee to manage the common affairs and interests of the newly landed elites, i.e. capitalists, the people who had replaced feudal lords. 
And policing, we know this through examining the historical record, we know police developed in the 18th century as a tool of the state to control and repress um, challenges to conquest, settler colonialism and capital accumulation. In the United States specifically, the earliest examples of, of policing and what would become modern police forces and units were slave patrols, groups used to coerce labor and break strikes, and uh, groups that were put together to, for mass removal of indigenous communities from land, life, and society. Examples of this classically are the Texas Rangers depicted in the bottom left corner. Now, with this in mind, with this political economic basis of policing, we can use that, I see you, James, thank you. With that, with this political economic basis of understanding what police are and where they come from, we can use that to understand why policing has changed over the past few decades and become so militarized and violent. That's where an analysis of neoliberalism comes in. And to put it briefly, neoliberalism is just this new phase in the, the 500 evolutionary history of capitalism. Capitalism is always changing. It's always changed, always finding new modes of production and displacing old forms of production and finance, right? And creating new ones. And in the past 40 years, we've seen this massive transition from the previous Fordist regime of, of production or Pre previous form of capitalism, where capital and labor were really close together, we had strong unions, the state actively worked to facilitate this relationship. We've moved away from that to a post Fordist model of development, where we've seen production sort of become decentralized. We've offshored our production processes across the world. Our economy has become way more globally integrated and fragmented. Now, what this this isn't just an economic process, but it's also a philosophical process. And the neoliberal philosophy really seeks to explain man, nature, and, and the universe. And it advocates for a reduced role of the state in enforcing laws. It justifies severe inequality and class polarization. It, it, it applies this really individualistic, cruel, and pluralistic economic logic to every aspect of society. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Work harder. If you're poor, it's your fault. If you're sad, it's your fault. We see this everywhere in social media culture these days. And applied to the realm of government, this logic has produced the dismembering of the welfare state and the social safety net and has created more institutions of social control and domination. In Southern California, neoliberalism has gutted the safety net it's deindustrialized the economy and grown the service economy and the logistics economy. It's fragmented labor and challenged labor unions and made labor unions almost like tiny and insignificant politically. And we've seen growing wealth and income inequality that is driving a horrible housing crisis. And non-white immigrant labor and working class populations have grown and are indispensable to the service and logistics economy. So what does that mean for policing? Police have increasingly, since this economic process has started, police have adopted more military style tactics of counterinsurgency, combat and conflict resolution, and they've deployed advanced weapons and intelligence technologies against our communities under broken windows policing or zero tolerance policing. And I argue and scholars like myself argue that this is an outlet for capitalist accumulation and it's a means for the state to exercise control and repression over the communities that are increasingly precaritized and disaffected by this new extreme form of capitalism. Effectively, the state has turned militarized and repressive policing against communities in order to uh, control and overwhelm and repress communities that pose real political threats to this political and economic regime. And these groups that they target, of course, are non-whites, immigrants, and the working classes. So gang injunctions exemplify this process because during the 1990s and 2000s, anti-gang legislation 
and hundreds of civil gang injunctions were implemented throughout California, primarily targeting poor Latino and black neighborhoods in impoverished urban areas. And I argue, if not consciously, this function to serve the to serve to repress and control the political and social mobility of tens of thousands of people, if not hundreds of thousands of people, but especially young people that would potentially become very politically active. And this aided neoliberal processes of urban development and gentrification, as Gabby was showing in her presentation, where where they implemented gang injunctions often underwent these extreme redevelopment pr processes with influx of millions of dollars for economic growth and development. And you can't separate this process of policing from the economic system we're living in. So just some concluding thoughts. Mo our movements challenging authoritarian policing and gang injunctions, we've won some really important legal victories and we've, in, we've developed great organizing praxis for waging movements and, and doing grassroots work with communities. But if we wanna achieve criminal justice reforms that are truly revolutionary and can bring about systemic change and challenges to policing, we need to center a structural analysis of the political economic system of settler colonialism and racial capitalism that has produced the situation we're living in now. And moving forward, I think it's really important that we begin to think about this and center this critique. So that's uh, that's my presentation. Uh, thank you for listening. I think I got close to under 10 minutes. Yeah, you did it. Uh, all right, uh, thanks everyone for presenting and, and uh, all doing our best to stick to the schedule. It leaves us about 11 minutes uh, for questions and discussion. Um, and uh, so I'll open it up to the room. You can, if you want, post questions in the chat. Um, I'm monitoring the chat and uh, see if anyone has a question or comment. I'll ask a question. Uh, what strategies do you think will be used in the next five years to defeat gang injunctions statewide? And do you think it's realistic to expect that gang injunctions will be outlawed within the next five to 10 years, given the move of progressive DAs and other strategies that have uh, you know, eliminated the kind of the cost effectiveness of police departments implementing gang injunctions uh, in their communities. Anyone who wants to answer it, go right ahead. It was directed to everybody. I can answer some of it. <laughs> Okay, so really here in California, um, counties have really reduced the use of injunctions. Uh, they moved away from them. The only two counties that are actively um, still pushing injunctions are Orange County um, and then the city of Coachella. So not even like the county, but the city of Coachella. Uh, San Diego was what, the third one, but they recently stopped um, pushing their injunctions. That was a huge win uh, with a lot of work that went into it. Um, so now it's how do we just stop the use in these two areas? Um, as you, if some of you may know, that Orange County is like really conservative. Um, there has been a shift, a political shift, um, and the current district attorney um, had agreed to restructure uh, injunctions, and we've been working with him on doing that. Um, obviously, our ask is that we dismantle them completely because we don't need them, um, and so. I, I'm hoping that in the next five to 10 years, they're no longer in use because um, from different forces, because they, they do, there is a community pushback now that they, um, so their cases that used to take about six months to push are now taking years because the community is fighting. Um, their department has gone from, you know, uh, four full-time attorneys to one part-time. 
So you see the shrinkage happening already in the district attorney's office. Um, and there is a new law, uh, an act that went in last year, the Racial Justice Act. I believe there was a, a presentation on it. Um, and so it's in here in California and it's up to the counties though to, in, to, put, to enforce it. So the counties are supposed to see if there's laws that are racially biased um, and how that could be addressed like in each county. And we are working on that with Sean. Hi, I'm Lisa Romo, and um, I'm a public defender, a state public defender. And so I've never really had any um, connection with and I have no knowledge of gang injunctions because I represent people who are um, accused of crimes. And now that um, the injunctions are diminishing, I'm wondering, is there an overlap? Is there a way to harness the amazing work and energy that you all have done on the injunction um, arena and, and move it over to support the challenge um, in the criminal courts for uh, gang allegations and charges? I can answer. I can, I, okay, go ahead. I can, I'll go and then you go again. I well, I with that in mind, I think that's the inevitable progression of where the movement's going to go. Because as Gabby was alluding to, gang injunctions are effectively becoming kind of obsolete policies that I think most police departments increasingly and DA offices are just see, seeing as it's, it's not they don't work. They're not really that valuable. They're kind of costly. They're not expedient to like what they're trying to do. So as the gang injunctions go away, I think it's inevitable. And we folks like Gabby and some of our other co-organizers have already started doing work on this um, and other people who have participated in this conference. I think that's where it's headed is challenging uh, sort of gang, gang legislation in general um, in the state of California. Um, I would add though, the thing I worry about this though, is that, um, the the DA offices and police departments, they're moving away from this because it's expedient to them and they recognize that maybe these policies just, it doesn't matter. They can still maintain political control and power. And uh, if nobody can afford to live in urban areas, if brown working class communities can't afford to live in these areas, of course, they're gonna stop using gang injunctions, right? If, uh, if, inequality keeps getting to what the going in the direction it's headed they won't even need to use repressive policing tactics because the, the communities they're trying to control might not even be in the areas that they they want to exploit right uh gabby you had thoughts though dad yes um and also what alex was saying uh so many of the areas where they're no longer pushing injunctions uh, the community has been wiped out. So they, they don't, they no longer exist. Like uh, Chavo's neighborhood, uh, there was, it was bulldozed down and now there's luxury apartments in that whole neighborhood. Um, and we see that in Echo Park, you know, we see that here in Orange County where, yeah, they're, they're no longer being enforced because those people don't live there anymore. So they met their goal of, of pushing people out. Um, but you had asked Lisa the overlap uh, with the public defenders. So we uh, work closely with some of the public defenders and we would love to see more collaboration. I know there's a lot of pressure and not just with, you know, with this area, um, but from, from what we understand, uh, up, you know, management saying like, don't get involved in those cases because they're not criminal, you know, they're civil, but they're semi um, because they start as civil and then they become criminal cases. And so I would like, they, they would be so helpful if there was more participation um, and a clear understanding. Like we need to, public defenders need to take, be more involved because they are gonna represent these cases. And so how can they start pushing back 
um, even though they're civil, civil cases. I know in the Bay Area, there's much more collaboration with the Public Defender's Office. With our uh, last couple of minutes, uh, we had, a, if that's an, uh, all on that question, there, uh, we'll squeeze in. Babe Howell was also trying to get in with a question simultaneously, and I'd like to open it up to her for a moment. Yeah, and I'm sorry, I joined late because I was torn between two panels. So if you've already answered this, um, my apologies. I'm with the Gangs Coalition in New York and a professor at CUNY School of Law doing work on gang policing and prosecution in New York for a long time. But one of the challenges that we see sometimes is like mobilizing some parts of the community to say, yes, bring the gang, take down, whatever. Did you have um, issues where parts of the community were resistant to your efforts, you know, and how did you meet those challenges? And if you already answered the question, uh, maybe you can, you know, DM me and I can, and I can, ask it someplace else. I, I could say a few words on that. And um, there is, there was uh, elements in the community saying, well, there is crime happening, right? And I think Abby spoke to it where you, where you uh, analyze the data and, and tie it back to the, um, the hyping up of like that gangs are the 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 cause of every single crime that happens in the community and dispelling that by breaking it down one by one right like get, they did that very very clearly in the work that um they in orange county and in santa barbara that's why in santa barbara successfully they they, they stopped it in its tracks we it was a process of learning and really convincing through forums dialogue actions uh residents that you know, the injunctions as they were written, uh, every, out of the 14 new rules of living, meaning the restrictions, 11 of them were already uh, criminal code, right? In other words, you can't cause battery upon somebody, right? That's already a crime. It doesn't, it, you don't need to be, uh, you know, there's, there doesn't need to be anything new added for that. It was the elements that we were fighting for, which we we're trying to protect, which was the curfew provision, the association clause, and then the, the clothing piece, right? Those things that were quote, non-crimes non um, that were, uh, we, we, we said that these are the things that we're concerned about because that's how you swoop everybody in versus an individual that makes a decision to, you know, cross the line and commit some, some sort of actual, uh, you know, breaking of the quote law, um, it, that that helped us out in the arguments, right? Uh, along along the way, uh, really really highlighting the fact that the injunction was a tool to bring all uh, everybody into the fold versus um, just particular. And this is why the the due process clause was so important, which because you have to prove that an individual quote is active, was doing stuff, was like you know um, you know you know uh, you know just active, right? And because it's so hard to prove that, uh, because almost by the criteria, that's the other thing, the criteria that we're using also was so broad. So just kind of honing in and all that. But in the end, we were saying, but the reality is, look at the investments that are happening. Why is there, you know, uh, you know horizontal uh, fratricide and things happening in the community? You know, what are the deeper core issues? I think um, Alex spoke to it, like what are the root causes of it? So kind of thinking the long-term. And I think the next phase is like, I know folks shy away from the word reparations, but similar to what's happening with, with the question of marijuana and things like that, like the war on drugs, all the effects that it can cause, the war on gangs did the same thing. So it's, uh, it's time to call for mass deep uh, investments in communities that were targeted by this, these militarization um, and containment strategies. Thanks very much, Chavo. Thanks to everyone for presenting. We have gone over time, but it doesn't mean it has to be the end of the conversations. If you still have questions or things you'd like to talk about, the conference is made available this uh, Kumo space, and I just placed the link. Um, when you, if you follow that link, it's very easy to use. If you haven't used it yet, you'll see it, it can be a little odd when you're in the space. It mimics an actual room. Look for the room that is called the patio. And you can meet up with some of us who, who may be there in a, in a few moments to continue this conversation. I want to thank all the panelists. I want to thank you each for coming. Um, 
and uh, let's continue the important work of battling this contemporary settler colonial model. Thank you very much. Um, and if anybody wants uh, the slides, just